Welcome to uh, Copenhagen Atomics. Uh, this is where we built the nuclear reactors of the future. Well, I'm delighted to be uh, here in Copenhagen with Thomas Jan Pettersen, the uh, CEO of Copenhagen uh, Atomics. Um, in Lit spoke to you about a year ago, um, interviewed you about uh, your technology, and we promised we'd be following uh, progress of the technology and the company. And here we are, you've invited us to your workshop here in Copenhagen in the Alpha Level uh, Innovation Center. Um, bring us up to date, but most importantly, t tell us why we should be excited about the technology that you're developing here. A lot of stuff has happened uh, in the last year. Uh, we are very proud of the technology that we are developing. It's a new way of doing nuclear energy that is uh, much more efficient than the classical nuclear. Even the some other company have other companies have something they call advanced nuclear, but this is completely different. It's much more efficient. The quick story is that we can make ten times more energy out of the same input fuel uh, as anyone else. So it's a very uh, advanced or a very efficient way of making nuclear energy, and. On top of that, we also create less nuclear waste than the traditional nuclear industry. Um, and we're even able to take the spent fuel from classical reactors and, and burn that fuel one more time and get 10 times more energy out of it. Without going into too much uh, detail, the, uh, the fuel is thorium and the technology is, is molten salt. Can you just expand on that a little bit? That's th sort of the whole trick, how, why it works. Uh, <clears throat> you need to combine the two. Thorium is an element uh, from the periodic table. It's something we mine out of the ground. It's a metal. Uh, it works sort of similar to uranium, but it's more efficient if you use it the right way. But thorium on its own does not create this huge uh, um, gain in the efficiency. You have to combine thorium uh, as a fuel with molten salt reactors, which is a, a type of reactors that there's only ever been built one of those. So we know they work, but uh, but the, we haven't shown that it works in big scale and, and that the price has come down. Uh, for for Copenhagen Atomics, we've done our calculations and we believe that we can get the price down to uh, $20 per megawatt hour uh, for electricity. And that is a very low price. It's a sort of at least half price of what everyone else is uh, um, putting out there. So it, it, it's definitely a revolution when this uh, get, gets up and running. So how does this fit into uh, the stage of the energy transition we're at? Who's it, who's it aimed at? What sort of countries um, that would be most suited to having this type of uh, nuclear technology? Nuclear technology takes a long time to roll out and I think this is also true for what we're doing but still we're trying to do it a little bit differently. We want to set up factories like car factories or airplane factories, a factory where we can make one reactor every day on an assembly line. So normally when you build a big nuclear reactor, it takes 10 years to build it, but we can build one reactor every day. So already there, we're on a completely different scale. But even if we do that, even if we have 10 of those factories where we make one reactor every day, it'll still take 30, 40 years uh, to gain the same market share as, for example, oil or gas. But that's definitely what we are aiming for. But you know, when you look at these numbers, uh, oil and gas is providing huge amount of energy. So these are a form of small modular reactor, which we hear about. Um, and the, uh, when I, what sort of countries or situations would be most suited for it? Because I believe that the technology doesn't require a lot of water, for example. So would they be suited for, for dry environments, for example? Uh, they, they could run in dry environments, but uh, um, one of the markets that we are very interested in is the ammonia market. So ammonia is used for fertilizer, but is also uh, Everybody believes that it's going to be used as one of the primary fuels for ships, big ocean-going ships, and also for mining equipment. The global market for green ammonia will be bigger than the entire European electricity market. So it, there's a huge market that we can go after, and I think ideally that would be one of the first markets we will go after. And since ammonia is a liquid fuel or a liquid substance, so, so you could essentially make it anywhere. I mean, it doesn't really matter which country you make it in, uh, as long as you're close to the coast, so you can put it on ships and ship it somewhere else. So back to that, we, we do prefer to be close to the, uh, to the water or the sea. Now, um, here in Copenhagen, uh, you've, you've got, I think, 50 engineers or t total staff of around 200 um, people working on this technology. Has Denmark proved to be a particularly a positive place for this kind of innovation to foster? 
The government is not pro-nuclear. They're sort of, uh, they just decided we don't want nuclear in Denmark and, and that doesn't matter for us. So, because this is a global technology, it's supposed to go to countries who want it. Uh, and in any case, Denmark would be sort of 0.1% of global energy. So, so, so it's not so much Denmark as a customer or a, a country where we built this in large scale, but I think uh, there's a good environment for developing advanced technologies here. Uh, we've seen in the past that Denmark was very influential on developing the mobile phone uh, systems we have today. Also, uh, something like the diesel engine was developed by a big, uh, big scale here in Denmark. Uh, a lot of software languages are developed in Denmark. So Denmark is fairly good at developing new technologies, and, and it also turns out that, that this one seems to be one of the things that we're good at. Now, what's the next step? I think uh, I understand you're looking for a country to host uh, a test reactor, a prototype. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the progress on that? Yeah, uh, that's uh, one of the more difficult things. Uh, we, uh, we've decided that there's no uh, regulatory uh, um, authority here in, in Denmark that could approve a nuclear reactor. Of course, the government could set one up, but that would take several years. So we prefer to go to a country that has already have a nuclear regulator. And uh, one of the countries we're talking to is the UK, but we, we're talking to a number of countries to see who would be the, one of the first ones to adapt this, uh, adopt this technology. And uh, of course, if we can get the first test reactor up and running there, we could probably then also get the first power reactors up and running. And uh, I mean, especially in the UK, there's, a, there's an extra big uh, upside because uh, the UK already have a lot of uh, separated plutonium. They have 140 tons of plutonium separated already, and that would give the UK enough fuel for uh, 30 gigawatts of electricity for 50 years, which is uh, basically the entire electricity grid of the U UK. And since the fuel is already there, they could get the lowest cost energy in Europe. Uh, but uh, yeah, even that is difficult to explain to uh, politicians in the UK. Um just wanted you to sort of uh, speculate a, a little bit ahead in the future. I mean, thorium technology has been around perhaps since the 1950s when it was first talked about. So it's kind of 70 years to get us to this point. Um, what's, what does your crystal ball tell you about the ne next few years? We're, I mean, we're not going to have to wait another 70 years before this is happening. Where, where, where do you see things going in the next yeah, few so years? Some of, one of the very first cars that was ever developed was also an electrical car. But then again, it, it took like 100 years before Tesla came around. And then now we have many people have electrical cars, right? And I, I think it's the same here. There, there was a few people who were eager about thorium energy back in the 50s and 60s. but but they sort of had too much resistance and they, didn't, they were not able to break through. And, and now today there's a few companies, I would say it's on the order of a few hundred people in, in the whole world who are really eager to see thorium energy break through. And I think it will happen this time. Uh, of course, I'm one of them, but, but I'm not alone. Uh, we are we're a bunch of people who really want to show that this is going to work. Uh, and it, it, it just takes the people who have the sort of um, the will to make it happen. And I think now is the time for that technology to break through. One of the problems back in the 50s and 60s, there were some really smart pe people working on it back then, but they didn't have computer simulations tools, so they couldn't do the simulations we've done today. And it actually took us seven years to develop the tools so that we can simulate it correctly. And it wasn't until last year that we really got uh, results that, that where we proved to ourselves that, okay, this is actually, it was actually even better than what we thought. So I think we're going to see quite an acceleration in the pace of, uh, of innovation of this technology. Exciting times ahead. Um, just one last question, uh, a personal one. I mean, what is it that perhaps drives you to get up every morning uh, and put your effort into the energy transition? I've studied how, what, what energy means to a society, like all the benefits to society, all the pr prosperity that comes from energy. and. I've been working with uh, exciting cutting-edge technologies my whole life, and that has been super exciting. But to be able to work on cutting-edge technology within the energy field, I feel this is... Uh, I'm, I'm deeply honored that this has been possible for me, and I, I would give my right arm to be able to be part of this team and be, be able to help bring this technology to the market. Thomas Jampiston, thank you very much for inviting Inlit on the road into your facility. You're thank most you. welcome.